coaches, welcome back to another Modern Soccer Coach interview. Today we are joined by Tim Keach, co-founder at Market Insights, does a lot of consultation work with teams around data. We've done a ton of interviews around data as it applies to tactics and players, but we've never done an episode of how data applies to coaching and how you can potentially measure the impact and effectiveness of coaches. Really, really interesting insight. Hope you enjoy it. Please, if you do, give it a like. Please subscribe. Really appreciate the support on the podcast. And please check out MSC preseason periodization package. Four webinars available now today. It's out today on the link below. Modern Soccer Coach preseason webinar package. Some unbelievable webinars around preseason and periodization. Get it today on the link below. Thank you so much. Here is Tim. Enjoy. Tim, thank you so much for joining me today on the Modern Soccer Coach Podcast. Very, very excited to chat. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for inviting me on. What a great topic. Um, I, I was thinking about how to open in this. And, and obviously, data, football, coaching, there's so much to this. There's so much growth in the last few years. I feel that whenever data initially came into the coaching space, it was a it was this lightning ball moment where coaches felt that they could separate the emotion from almost the clarity of this is how to define a success and and it I don't know if it's it's helped in a lot of ways I don't know if it's delivered in the clarity aspect as much but when I was reading your work and seeing your work I thought oh this is this is actually where we need to move conversations more in coaching and the first part is style alongside results or style instead of results which i i actually still kind of struggle with and your your article how style matters like oh this is it this is it here we go let's talk more um describe the process of using data to define style and give us a bit more on that Great. So this is going to uh, separate the pragmatists from the uh, the philosophy guys that right down the middle. So um, one of the things that we wanted to do as a company was kind of use data, as much data as we can to look at coaches. And the easiest thing to do is just say that guy's an improved the team. The, the points have increased, the expected goals have got better and um, say these are the good coaches. But one of the things that we noticed and, and the way we the kind of methodology for this was we've got full Y Scout API, which means we've got every game Y Scout I've ever tagged and logged. Um, we've got data scientists. So instead of just saying, what are the basic stats we can get? What percentage possession did they have? What we wanted to do was say, let's let's actually create metrics because we spend a lot of time with coaches. Let's let's create metrics that fit with what they're talking about. So someone says to me, I play through the thirds. What does that actually mean? So we kind of codified the coach's language into things that would show up as things that were actually happening in games. So, for example, playing through the thirds, we count that as any move that starts in the defensive third, goes to the middle third, goes into the attacking third, um, whilst keeping possession in all that, that sequence. So we're saying that's, that's somebody who plays through the thirds. So if we can measure that and similar things like pressing and counter pressures and everything that coaches talk about, and then we can get that code, run it through every single game of file, which is thousands of lines of code, and pick out those patterns and then allocate those sequences to particular coaches. Can we find, can, because we've got data back to 2015-16, can we look at who's good now, where they were coaching then, and what they were doing? And if you strip out the, the XG and the box entries and things, does that still give you an indication that these guys were, were coaching football that the bigger teams would look at and say, that's the style I want? So like an obvious example, and someone we, we worked with at the time at MK Dons was Russell Martin. Um, splits opinion within the EFL world, but there was no doubt that he was someone who was coaching a style of football that was attractive to bigger clubs. Uh, Swansea took him, Southampton took him from Swansea. Now he didn't get, until Southampton, he hadn't had promotions. He hadn't had particularly um, a dominant budget. But what he had was a, a way of working that appeals to clubs. Because one of the things you find when you look through the data is that possession does really matter to the biggest teams. We, we talk about results on the pitch. Results on the pitch are great. Um, and I would never say to a coach, don't try and win. But you're looking at it and you're like, if I want to make the most of my career, what style of, what will the bigger teams be looking at? What will they be looking at within 
within the beyond just the points and points are important obviously and you want to keep your job you've got to win points but i think it's a it's a greater point that if we just put points and xg in our model then you're just finding the good teams when you take those out it just it just highlights another layer of interesting people to look at and certainly um when we've gone back through the data of, of the guys from national league from league two from league one it wasn't necessarily always the guys with the biggest budgets who won promotion. It was the ones who were playing a certain style of football who got promoted. It's not promoted with their teams, but promoted through the, the the kind of tiers of football. Yeah, very interesting. I I almost think as coaches, we've become, thanks, thanks to the media probably and the way we're consuming coaching, it's kind of binary thinking about, all right, you're either a possession-based or you're, you're a long ball merchant. And it's easy to tell the long ball merchants mm. because of that style. But I think it's fallen into now you're a long ball merchant or you're not. And the problem is is that the, the, the volume of not can range from two passes and lose possession to 25 passes. And yeah. I think what's interesting is now you're looking at saying, OK, so we've gone through an era of, of tracking player recruitment and, and ADPs and all this here. We're now at a stage where we should be looking maybe or we should be looking now more at tracking coaches and seeing if they if they fit certain profiles that's right and i mean certainly that's been a kind of big growth area for my company has been working with clubs um like it's not just data there's obviously personality and we'll get onto that later i'm sure but i think a big part of it is um the club saying we want to move in this direction and, and increasingly with sporting directors with with more involved ownership, they are setting these kind of central what is this club strategy documents. Again, something we, we do a lot with clubs is like, okay, you want to be in the championship. That's just the name. How do you actually turn that into a, a strategy to get to where you want to be and looking at the individual parts to make that up? And one of that is how do we want to play football? If we're going to allot the, the word alignment, you'll hear a lot. Like how are we going to align coaching to recruitment to every uh, to, to kind of training methodologies to to uh, nutrition and fitness and sports science and all other aspects of the club, we want to we want to have at the front of that a club way of playing football. And if we're saying that's how we play, the first question is: Do you actually play like that at the moment? And if you don't, do you have an aim of where you want to get to? And if you do, how are you going to measure progress along that that pathway? So I'm not saying that you can in one year you can take a team that's playing long ball football and turn them into a prime Barcelona. It's going to be a, a multi-stage process. And part of that is is having a way of identifying through data how you are playing. And then all your kind of tactical periodization and things you talk about as coaches, you can put into saying, OK, in 12 weeks, are we going to be better at building through the thirds? Are we going to have more long pass sequences? It doesn't have to be, as I say, overnight. So if you take um, a good example was QPR under Gareth Ainsworth, quite direct um, in our model possession score is kind of bottom 10 10 percent off so like there weren't many teams that had less of the ball and and built through the thirds less then marty sequentes who was working out in sweden came in he was with hammerby and they had previously scored um a 0.9 on our model which is a very very strong possession oriented team so he's taken qpr from like 10th centile to 40th centile in in six months so there's a clear progression now no one's saying if you watch qpr now they're Again, they're not they're not Manchester City under Pep, but they are certainly significantly more um, possession based, and that's showing up in the data. So direction of travel is important, and there's also this concept that you can't do it with uh, certain players. You have to have a certain level of player before you can play a certain way. And yeah, if you're gonna, I think if you're playing in the Premier League and you try and try and like probably Norwich under Fark, they tried to match teams for football, and you realise quickly that Premier League teams are Premier League teams because they have better individuals and if you try and match them up in the same way you'll probably lose well Sir Thomas Frank has probably adapted his game model a lot more for um, looking where they can get competitive advantage and for us from the research we've done like pressure which isn't we, we talk about possession as one way of playing we talk about pressure as like the other kind of good way of playing so there's a kind of territorial dominance like you want to keep the ball away from your goal closer to the others so you look at the managers who have done that they generally that correlates better with success, immediate success, than implementing a possession-based model. But if you're looking at people like Luke Williams, who was at 
um, Notts County and has gone to Swansea. You're looking at Brian Barry Murphy, who was at uh, Rochdale and managed to get kind of a bottom end League One club playing very attractive football. Uh, ben Garner, who was at Swindon and a few other clubs, they've all developed possession based models without um, possession based player. And Luke Williams obviously got a promotion. So it's not that you can't get teams playing in a certain way. I mean, Jim McNulty at Rochdale is scores really highly on our model. It's another team that we've done some work with. And, and Jim is a possession based coach. And Rochdale have got uh, had a lot of problems, well documented financial problems, but have still committed as a club to a way they think develops players better and gets them higher prices for their players. And if you look at their transfer record, they sell a lot of young players for a lot of money because they play a style of football that is attractive to scouts from larger clubs who also play that style of football. And But from a coaching point of view, it also shows probably Jim McNulty will be someone that clubs will be picking up on models like ours and saying, hang on, that guy is playing good football on a small budget. What could he do with a bigger budget? And I think that increasingly is the way that clubs are going to recruit yeah, so so you you answered my my next question, which was going to be that well, the, the coach X will say that listen, I've only got these players, and I'm in a league that the ball's traveling in the air for a lot of times. I got to get results to get people off my back. But you're saying that you would then, if that's going to be a possession based coach, you would then you would chart that over a period of time to see that there's growth in that area. That's the measurement, not necessarily a straight up metric of where they are. Would that be right? That's right. That's right. I think we look at change in direction of travel. And I, that pragmatism is is necessary. Like it, it's uh, you can't be saying I played great football. We lost the last five games six <laughs> nil. Uh, no one's going to care. You're not going to be in a job very long. So I, I, I'd never say to any coach, abandon the principles of trying to win games. But it's more like, what can you do as a coach that shows a direction of travel to a club? And I'm sure we'll talk later about how clubs can assess whether they're managers are doing well so it's, it's one of those things that I always say no one can flick a switch it's it's a process yeah but just on that there's the I forget what book it is um you would you would know better than me about the Klopp story at Dortmund when you know it was his last season or hmm. he the was, was bad and or the, de- the underlying data was good the results were bad yeah, yeah. like is that you know, it sounds great, right? From like Liverpool saw something and they knew that the performances were still good. Mm. But at the same time, it's Dortmund. You can't be losing those games at big clubs. Yeah. Um, it, it all worked out. So I'm not saying that. But but how much of that, you know, you being in the business of it, how much of that is actually true, and how much of that there's a bit more to this story? I think I think there's always more to the story. Like Klopp had already got to a European Cup final with Dortmund and uh, won won the league. So he was he was hardly a, a, a plucked name out of obscurity. But uh, yeah, I always I always laugh at that story about uh, underlying data and trusting underlying data. And I think instinctively you know that um, a manager can have a bad season. Everything can go against you. And and underlying data is a good way of just quantifying that that's true rather than just an excuse. But I mean we've all seen. Um, clubs have a bad season and if you're a new manager and you have a bad season you get sacked but if you've got some credit in the bank I think they'll let you get away with it if it's injury or or just like with Klopp a couple of times you've seen it with Klopp teams they kind of have a an amazing season where they win almost every game and then there's a hangover from that physical tiredness clubs change the way they play against you it's hard to keep that level of energy going so all those types of things factor into I think there's a you're allowed a rebuild season if you've got to the European Cup final. Hello, coaches. We'll take a quick break here. If you're in the process of planning for your pre-season, we have the perfect resource, Modern Soccer Coach Pre-Season Periodization Package. Four webinars delivered by some of the best in the business around football and periodization. Matt Wilmot, Ian Cole, Stevie Grieve, Kevin Paxton, unbelievable experience at the top of the game and experience around periodization models as it applies to youth football, as it applies to training methodology, as it applies to GPS and software and as it applies to the game model. Unbelievable Four webinars available today on the link below at a bargain if you're looking for pre-season insight. Some great information around physical planning and great information around periodization. Get it below on the link below. ModernSoccerCoach.com available today. Thank you so much for your support. Back to Tim. 
But there's also, if it's a smaller club, there's usually a selling models are now the, the big thing. So selling models will mean that you're you're going to hit, you can't just, you know, take out talent out of your team every year and, and replace that with talent and sell it. That It's just the theory based or model around that doesn't work. Exactly. Is, is that is that something that is also yeah. the consideration? I mean, what we tend to do when we're doing deeper dives into managers, we kind of look at whether they're the club they're going to be working for and the clubs they worked at were we call them like build phase and performance phase. So if you you sell a lots of players, you get a lot of churn between your squad between seasons. It's very rare for a team that changes seventy percent of players uh, to succeed in the next season. They always need that season of building up, getting some getting a semblance of a continuity between the players and then kind of going the second season after that you're like that's your performance phase and we use that a lot with clubs it's like we did we worked with Plymouth Argyle for quite a few years really and um, we kind of had this promotion and then we had like the next year it was like we start conceded loads of goals so it was like we need to change the squad so we we kind of strengthened the defence the next season was a performance season because we we had a solid base and they got 80 odd points and then the next season, it was like, OK, we'll keep the core of the squad and just add in some extra goals. And they got the promotion to the championship the year after. So it's that phasing in and all the way, because they're really data savvy, they've got that way of working. Other clubs may have said, oh, we got 80 points. Let's take the office for our players. Let's let's reset. And uh, they kind of back to the idea that you could build on build on the work that the whole club with our, our help had, had done over the time and really go for it. And uh that same at Luton, that was their kind of approach over multiple years. It kind of assessed the market, assessed the phase we're at, assessed the transfer market and the value and the competition and then go from there. So I think coaches who are working in systems where there is a, a strong use of data and a strong use of um, feedback reporting and we're all in this together type feeling do better than the ones where it's like work a miracle, here's your squad, get on with it. <laughs> it's got to be a, a joint process. Yeah, but here that all oh, this is a topic. So, because every you mentioned the word alignment, we laughed. It was like everyone's using this alignment. And you said they're data savvy, and I see now people saying buying, buying into data. The coaching staff are buying into data. This is now a, a term that's been used around. I think the data community around people that are starting to support. But but there's obviously so many variables. But if the data work. It also goes the other way that if the data work is inaccurate or maybe not presented well or maybe not understanding context, then the data person hasn't effectively communicated it. Like in your eyes, how would you define something, some a club that is data savvy? What does this all encompass? That's it. I think I think everyone who works in data has to know it's not infallible. There's there's always context. Like contextual data is the most important thing. Really, it's and it's not making excuses. It's kind of saying, this is what the data is saying. The data is saying we are conceding far too many chances. Now, you don't want to take that and just take it as gospel and say that is that is the truth. We, we need to change that because maybe your central midfielders have been injured and you're playing a, an 18-year-old and is getting bypassed too easily. That's that's a coaching point that maybe you can you can tactically tweak something to stop that. And that's that's useful information. The thing is, that we as data people have to understand is coaches are watching the game. So they are they are watching the game. They're, they're picking up on these things. That's what their profession is, is to notice it. What we tend to be able to do is give you the context of, okay, you know you're an expert on what you're doing and you're spending all day with your players. This is how you stand against your peer group in terms of performance because they're not watching every game in the league. They're not watching every game around Europe. They haven't got time. No one has. But the data can give you an indication that says, OK, we think we're really good at passing through the thirds and build-up play, and we think we're one of the best teams in the league. Now, that data doesn't bear that out. The data says we're we're below average. Um, is it we're doing well given the context of the budget and the context of the players we have? Is it is it that we don't know what the, the level is within this league? And always have a takeaway from it. So if you're working with a coach and you're working um, as a recruiter or as a data analyst with a coach, it's always you can't just give a string of numbers. You've got to talk football. <laughs> and I think the biggest compliment we've had as a as a company was when we were hired and the sporting director um, said to the media why they were working with us. And it's like, we've tried a few companies, but these ones speak football. 
And uh, I was like, that that was good because we always try and make sure that when we're talking to a coach and we do work directly with, with a lot of coaches, it's like we can give them numbers and we can give you, if they're talking about pressing and someone's saying, oh, you're bad at pressing, your PPDA number is really high, um, you need to change that. And we're like, yeah, but if you look at counter pressing, you're really good. Shots ending from counter pressing, that's really high. Maybe the PPDA is misleading because you're playing a, a slightly lower line than other teams or you're you're not. You, you can get your PPDA low just by kicking the ball in the corner and instantly challenging for it whilst you're a build-up team. So there's always giving them the context that the raw data doesn't give and explaining to them in footballing terms why something that might look like a red flag isn't or something that might look fine is actually bad considering that's our main build-up method or something. So you want to make sure that as a, a data person, you understand enough about football that you can confidently speak to a coach. And the, some coaches are absolutely brilliant and they, they love all the data. Others in the past have been dismissive. They've been like, I don't care what the data says, I know my team. And it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> um, yeah. And you'll find probably that just a stereotype, but the new generation of coaches probably have grown up with data as part of the, the courses. They've, they they want their stats ever since I announced the, the model on a, on a, uh, Twitter the other day uh, that we're doing. I've had a lot of messages saying, what's my score like? And so can you send me my profile? So people, and these are coaches working at decent level clubs, they're buying into it and they're wanting they're wanting the stats probably for a pay rise if they're doing well. But, uh... <laughs> I, but, but I think uh, what's really interesting there is the piece that you said that the, that the coach is watching so many games today and that the, that the analyst who maybe isn't getting that buy-in is coming up and saying, well, all right, in order for a coach to scout effectively today with tactical analysis, they're going to have to watch four or five games and at a level that they're seeing rotations and positional interchanges. That takes an incredible amount of time. Sometimes the data person is pulling up a spreadsheet with that metric and it's come in and, and the, the work isn't done on the, the back end of preparation, uh, which is the disconnect. And I find that so interesting where... I think coaches sometimes get a bad rap today about being invested in data, but you're saying mm -hmm. what it, you know, if you make it related to their world, um, it changes, can get them to, you know, take it a bit more seriously. Yeah. I think you always have to have something you can do with it. Like you can give someone a list of numbers, but there has to be a coachable kind of implementable point to what you're saying. So we've done probably four or five years ago to do these like 70 page opposition analysis reports, like, What's the expected threat from the left back? Where's the where, who's who's the uh, who takes the throw-ons and who receives and things? And at the end of the day, you could break it down to like the, the right winger puts in crosses from the right hand side of the pitch into the middle of the box. It's like what are you actually learning from this? So we've ended up with far more targeted. Like what what are the kind of two or three takeaways that in a two two day turnaround or one training session that you can specifically say to the to the team like. This team typically is what we classify as a, a direct team. They've got a big striker. They play off him. Um, make sure you're there for second balls and knockdowns. And the reality is probably all you can get out of a, a half an hour preparation session when you've got that kind of session. So I think it's just it's been a learning experience for us that not everyone is Marcello Bielsa and going to be studying 70 hours of video footage and micro analyzing everything. Most managers, in, in my experience, most managers don't have time. They have their own game model and they can make a couple of tweaks around the opposition, but they're not building whole game plans each 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 week based on the, the opposition. They'll have a couple of things they do. They might be, like, you get the occasional story, don't you, of, oh, the analyst pointed out the goalkeeper's 10 yards forward, so we tried a shot from the halfway line and all those kind of nice stories. But the reality is for every one that comes off, there's a 100 things that are mentioned and the situation doesn't arise or, or the left back's dodgy is about as far as you can get for <laughs> a lot of the analysis. And yeah. it's like, it, it, it really does vary, like, but from club to club and from manager to manager. And some of the best ones that do barely any prep and some of the, the ones who are really um, have not had the results are really, really, like, in-depth people. So how much it matters, I think, is you'll never really know. I think it's just as long as the coach is comfortable at the level they of detail they need to, to feel comfortable going into the game. I think yeah. that's that's what you need. Hundred percent. And there's a great there's a great Bielsa quote around that is is that 
such and such can not do anything and win, and such and such can do a, a load of prep and lose. So it's, it's, yeah. Um, anyway, um, the concept of of tracking coaches. I stay on that there, and you mentioned there about you know coaches obviously being engaged about where they stand on that there. And as you go down the ladder, and you, you've written a little bit about this as well, or you've written a lot about actually this year about the subjective side and and media and and losing the changing room. And I guess my question would be. Um, when you're managing the media and you're managing players, those are very, very subjective areas. So how do you, you know, if I'm that that up and coming coach in the third division that's playing a style of football and hmm. ho- I'm hoping to get on the radar of a championship or you know, Premier League team at some stage, how would you gauge my ability to manage media and, and players? Yeah, so um, I think we always we kind of use the phrase kind of data is just information. So you're not going to get a his his a zero point six at managing the media. You're, but what you're going to get is um, clubs will ask us, can you can you look up his interviews, see if you watch watch a couple of post match pre match things, watch some things after heavy defeats, watch some things after victories. Uh, I, I set up a Google alert for for the guy's name in the media, and you get these kind of things saying whoever blasts media in press conference and stuff and it comes up or sometimes you're working for like big clubs it'll be have they mentioned a rival club in a positive or negative way or and particularly I mean if you've got talking about the clubs with extremely passionate fan bases any indication they've had any affinity for a rival club at any point is an automatic no so it's all these types of things that you you're gathering data on um I think handling pressure and hand things like that you want to you want to look at a variety of situations. And I would say in terms of media and kind of advice for up and coming coaches, I guess it's just remaining calm, remaining polite. It's difficult because this is a, an emotional business. Um, it's it's really not, people are put off by people who, um, like when you're talking big clubs, you're talking multi-million pound brands, billion pound brands. They don't want someone who's going to suddenly shout at someone or um, uh, just swear in a press conference aggressively at someone it really does like those type of incidences I think famously was it Joe Kinnear or someone went into a a meeting and uh, started shouting pointing at individual journalists and calling them calling very rude names so if you can avoid doing that that's a good thing and uh, people joke about you kind of uh, bog standard uh, oh the group type kind of the group did really well and the group are doing this all that media training stuff but it it's a safe way of getting around it. You can show some personality, but I think sometimes bland answers are fine. Uh, that's what that's what I'm, I'm starting to think is that like Brendan Rogers got a lot of stick for a great character, you know, and all those lines. But like that's probably the way best way to go, right? Is just repeat that every single week. It it seems to be like I think it's one of those things where what the positive side of showing a good personality and some are like Russ Martin or, or or Luke Williams have shown personality and still succeeded. But I think the, the generic kind of approach to answering questions is like, don't throw anyone under the bus. Don't blame individuals. Um, collect, take take responsibility, collective. We're a, we're a team. We're all in it together type approach. It is all the kind of cliched media lines that Brendan and everyone else uh, trots out. And it's like, what what's the alternative? The alternative is you you break those rules and you're hammered for breaking the rules. So I'd say, yeah, I'd say always make sure that you're kind of take a deep breath before you answer a question. People do try and needle you. They will. And it's it's like learning to deal with that. And it's compared to somewhere like Brazil, where I think they have to do like 20 hours of media a week. It's not so bad here. <laughs> yeah, God. Um, what, let's move on now to, to sacking the manager, also something you've, you've written about very very interesting and, and obviously you're yeah that this i i struggle with this one because i just think there's so many variables like i struggle to understand how um funny the the Vieira interview and i watched it yesterday and he you know there the group were saying on the overlap that yeah but you had a run of games coming up that you know would have the palace would have helped yeah. but he he said yeah, and, and it shows they made the right decision because they won those games. Uh, and I thought, oh, help me out here. I, I'm still struggling to understand because the coach will say, you know, I'm sure if you, if you go into uh, an executive meeting with the head coach and you say, listen, results aren't good enough, 
they've got at least five pretty valid excuses about mm. why it's dropping. So how do you differentiate or how does a club differentiate between, you know, this having to make a change uh, and and really like you mentioned there about Klopp and, and you know, riding it out or, or yeah. being patient? Yeah, and it's, it's difficult because I've seen all, all situations. I've seen situations where the club have stuck with them and then they've turned the corner. Like um, I think Ryan Lowe at Plymouth was a really good example. He was, um, they gave him a new, he lost six games in a row or something like that. It could have been something, so hadn't won in quite a while. The club gave him a new contract. Everyone was like, what are you doing? And and Simon Hallett, the owner was like, this he's doing, he's doing everything we want him to do. And we believe that things will change and they did change. And I think, he got the Preston job, Plymouth were top of the table. Um, so it's, it, I've seen like that, that. I've seen it where the momentum, the underlying performance has been great and the, the results have been terrible and they stuck with it and stuck with it and it's never turned. And then it's been too late and the club's, the club's been relegated, even though all the way along the underlying was fine. And that is luck. Luck is such a key part of football that I, I've written about luck a lot. And it's, I really believe a lot of people doing the right thing have um, got very unlucky and a lot of people who have done a lot less of the right things have got incredibly lucky and that's unfortunately that's life in a low scoring sport of football that is just how it works so like human emotion and pressure and momentum they're real things like it's very there are clubs are nasty places to be when you're in a bad run we've had had situations where everything's great apart from the results and then everyone's like oh isn't it funny luck will turn it will be fine and then it's not and then People are being sacked. People lose jobs. Um, the budgets get cut. People people sh- are shouting and screaming in corridors. Incredible amounts of stress in the in the employees, and it's horrible to see. Really, so you need to do that. And I think the big issue is like I always say, like if if your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And it's uh, there's one there's one thing a club can do, and it's change the manager during a between transfer windows. All they can do is change the manager. And if things are going badly. You can you can sit there with your analytics hat on and say, well, actually, we were due a, due a win anyway. Our underlying performance was good. Um, it would have happened anyway, but you can't prove it. And a lot of the time, um, it, it's it's coincidence. And a lot of the time, it's changing stuff does freshen things up. It does make people think, oh, the new manager bounce is a is a thing that people th- says happens. I think. I think there's research that says a new manager bounce is a thing, but it tails off very quickly and your underlying very rarely changes. And even then, like sometimes you look at some managers who've done really well um, and they've looked at it and it's it's uh, like Paolo Ancelotti at Everton. His underlying performance was no different to Marco Silva, but his results were a lot better because sometimes there is such a thing as an aura or there is the calmness they bring, the personality. Maybe the players aren't any different or any better, but they're able to get more out of them from from lesser performance. So one thing we do, um, which I don't know if it helps or not, to be honest, but we do it anyway, is kind of take an independent view. We do this thing where we, at the beginning of the season, we forecast on performance and we, it's fairly accurate. You kind of use bookmakers. They they, they don't lose money for a reason. They're, they're fairly accurate. Uh, long-term predictions of relative performance. You, you get teams that outperform, of course, but generally they're around the right kind of range. And then you've got, um, individual kind of blocks of fixtures, what you're talking about with Vieira, you've got, you have horrible runs and you have nice runs. And it's like before the each six games, we kind of predict the next six and say, given where we are, we think a decent performance would be three points from the next six games. And often that upsets the club and they're like, why are you saying we're going to do so badly? And we're like, we did that for a club over the last season. I think we were within two or two, two to three points for every, every block of fixtures. Because as the kind of people one step removed, you take the emotion out of it. You say, you're on a terrible run of form. You've got injuries. You can see that things are going badly. So it's going to be three points from the next six games. Sometimes you're like, you've got really easy fixtures. You're in good form. It's going to be it's going to be 18 points. Um, and you can kind of take that step back and view it. And then that all, almost kind of sets the expectations for the club. Now, would I say it would save someone from the sack? No, it, it definitely hasn't. But I would say... If you're able to kind of offer a slightly detached view of where the club is um, and what your your independent advice would be, and kind of say this guy's pretty good, the the data's all pointing that we're improving. If you, as the leadership group, can offer that that assurance, 
it's going to be easier than if you go in there and say you've got to win the next two games or you're out. Because I don't think that negative pressure helps anyone. But sometimes changes happen. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes well, every change is an opportunity for another coach. So you can't you can't say never sack anyone. But I think sometimes pressure builds and it starts affecting the atmosphere, and that has a big impact on results. So you do have to do it occasionally. Yeah, and I, I, it's so interesting. The I watched the QPR. You mentioned QPR before. I watched the documentary, the, the old one. I watched it on yeah. YouTube. Oh, man. and it's it's so funny and interesting. And I wonder if you know smart business people that come into a club and then have the business skill to drive something and and obviously to put to put uh, money in. And I mean, I never really had like if I own a printing company, I don't really get any you know uh, glory for that. But I buy a football club, and all of a sudden. People think that I'm putting money in, so they start to, you know, sing my name and stuff like this. Yeah. But then, as soon as the the guys got criticism, as soon as the fans turned on them, it was as if, like, emotionally, the the ownership just went, oh no, 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 I can't deal with this. And I wonder how that, you know, again, coaching comes across as being impacted by the emotion, but how much does ownership being impacted by community emotion? How much do you think that? Is, is uh, it's it's incredibly pressured football like no other industry as you say you don't get this in anything else you don't go to the supermarket and someone complains that you didn't order enough paper clips at work or whatever it just doesn't happen so i i find that the publicity um i imagine like i've got kids and uh if they're coming home from school and they're saying everyone says you're terrible at your job and you should be sacked just the kind of the pressure, and I've, I've spoken to a lot of managers about, like, and sporting directors and other people, I've said, like, how do you cope with it when you know it's completely unfair? Like, how do you deal with it? And they're like, I think that is such an input. I couldn't do it. Um, I'm far too thin-skinned to any any criticism. Oh, how dare you? Um, and uh, they they seem to just either let it wash over them or they they have psychological support. And I think, or they, they find ways to completely switch off from football. All those kind of things, I think, the difference between a coach and a head coach and a, or a manager or whatever we want to call them is that scrutiny that you get as a head coach. And to the to the extent that people just horrible, like horrible things people will say and messages you'll receive. And it's like, I think the ability, A, it shouldn't happen, but B, it does. And uh, if as it does is how do you, how can you be, how can you support them as a club? And how can you structure your club so that the pressure is, is taken spread around rather than just being focused on one guy, but it, you do have to have a way of dealing with it, and it's it's unfortunate that you do. But I think um, a lot of guys get very cynical and switch off from football and and end up not liking it because of the the things that happen in the industry. But yeah, I think as a coach, and you're working with players, you 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 become a coach because you love working with you love football, you love working with players, you love making people better, and then suddenly you're being 40,000 people calling you an idiot <laughs> at best every week. It becomes really different. It's, it's a completely different experience. So, yeah, hard. Hard, hard. Um, and Because it, it, I was just doing an interview yesterday with, with, a, with a professional coach who's, who's saying that, yeah, sometimes football clubs are, are, are quite, the dynamics are, are quite unique in terms of walls being put up and, and stuff like that there. And I think, Again, buzzwords, culture, trust. Can you really have trust in a in a in a fast moving environment which is up for grabs every week? Like probably not. The the trust that I find really interesting is the recruiting this area of recruitment, which again you're you're starting to see more of with football directors, chief executives, um Solskjaer, uh, was on the overlap, and he, I found it really interesting. Of course, the whole United thing—you could do a whole podcast of everyone's done hundreds of them about. Well, should they have signed us? Should why is it all gone wrong? But what was interesting, I thought, when he was talking, was almost that area of like how adversarial the recruitment and coaching technical departments can be. That if they're coming in and saying, "I need this to get over the line for my football department," yeah, and, and they have people that are all saying, "Well, actually." Because we, like I've I've seen radars and there's there's always something in a radar that's down at twenty thirty percentile. So yeah. what's to stop for me focusing on that there and saying oh yeah but you know Messi's heading averages are down 
you know, yeah. our match. And how how do they how do you advise that, or do you advise that the the cohesion between different departments has to be again aligned or at least positive? Yeah. The, the positive relationship is key. Um, I think the probably the main thing, and this is where I always go back to strategy, like what is the strategy for the club? If you're Manchester United, you've got to win things. Like if, and I mean, I'm not criticising Chelsea directly, but if you look at Chelsea's, um, what what are Chelsea? Chelsea are probably see themselves as a club that should be winning league titles. So your recruitment then is different to a Brighton who have a, business model which is rely on player development so as a coach you can say you're putting me under pressure to win titles you're giving me players with a view to developing and selling and adding value to players are can those two go in hand in hand yeah they can but if you're putting in extreme pressure to win to win now um and giving me players who are not at the level of the best four teams in the country yet um I've, i'm gonna have that year or two of underperformance if during that year or two of underperformance you sack me all I've done is kind of sacrifice my reputation for your project for two years um because everyone now thinks well he finished 12th with Chelsea rather than saying this guy is like Graham Potter this guy was the best up-and-coming player developing football coach in the country a few months at Chelsea this guy's rubbish (laughs) and it's like it's the same coach it's just was a different job and a different different phase of build phase, performance phase, whatever we want to call it, was a different phase. So I think there has to be clarity about the purpose of the club. There has to be clarity about who does the recruitment, who signs it off. The most frustrating thing for recruitment departments is where a manager comes in, watches two minutes on Y Scout and dismisses a player they worked for for six months. Likewise, I imagine for a coach, he's being put under pressure to win and then to be given a, a centre forward who's he believes is not the right fit and he doesn't like any of the players being suggested and he knows a player he worked with before which is the old cliche everyone goes back to their old clubs for someone who does the job um and they want that player because they want to win and their their reputation so i'm always like who's taking the risk the front guy the guy has to go in front of the crowds is the guy who is going to be judged on the recruitment the recruitment team are going to be judged on the value add of the players i signed him he's now worth three five times what we paid that's how they get their next job. They don't get the next job on, I signed a 27-year-old and we finished in eighth place. Um, whilst for the manager, that might be a, what they want to do to get their next job. So it's always like, who's who are you asking to take the risk? What are the motivations of each individual person? And the job of the owner, ultimately, and then the sporting director to deliver the strategy is to get everyone aligned, make sure the coach is a coach who buys into the process and the stage of the club, make sure the recruitment team know the strategy and the the finances and everything of the club. And they work together at the beginning of the season to say, these are our aims. This is how we achieve it. Let's assess the squad together. Let's find out where we think coaching can help. Let's look where we think recruitment is required. When we're recruiting, what are the profiles? And then let's get some options that we can all look at together and we can feed back. So we know that the worst thing is where a coach says, I'm not having him and gives you no other information. And the worst thing probably for a coach is where you're being shown endless clips of a player and you're like, no, he does not do what, what I think. So it's just having that communication. And like one of the good things I really see that the best clubs do is having a common language around players. So instead of saying, I want a six, well, what's that mean? Because some managers will call it six, some will call it a four, some will call it a ball winner, some will call it a deep playmaker. What do we mean by a, a, a player profile? And so making sure that if I'm working with Russell Martin, he says I want a a uh, inverted 10, whatever it might be. I know what he wants. If I'm working with, with Jose Mourinho and he says, I want a, I want a Makalele type, I know what he means. And it's like just everyone has their own language. So I think it's almost like can you find a, a common language that is used across all departments of a club? The head coach uses it, the, the recruitment team, the sporting director. We have those attributes in mind. We, we look at a player and we say, good player, not for us. He's just not the right profile. Because there's lots of good players, but does he fit your budget? Does he fit your style? Is he better than what you've got? And just having this kind of approach where I can go to a coach in a in a six months after he starts working and I say, I found you, I found you the the six for this club, and we'll know what what each other means by that, and I'll I'll have confidence that the profile is what he wants. 
Yeah, yeah. But it, the same almost applies to management then, right? Where you, you're bringing in a manager and and kind of talked about this, about having the right objectives, about what you want for the manager. But also, uh, it, it's a, uh, I even talked to a colleague yesterday who was, who's in the professional game and, and had been in a few job uh, interviews and, you know, didn't get it. And then you start talking about people who did get it. And then you start eventually. And I, I just put my hand up. I said, listen, I, I don't understand what, what, how people choose managers um, yeah. at all. And what are some things that, or no, no, what about this? What are some mistakes that you think people make when they when they give someone a three year deal who isn't the right candidate? I think I'm, I'm going to go back to strategy again, but there's got to be um, the ownership have to know what they're trying to build. Like too often, there's this thing owners say, which really annoys me, which is like, I'm not a football expert. I'm like, you're not a football expert. That's that's true. It's good that you acknowledge you're not one. But who is like, who is the football expert in this setup? Like, if you're just going to outsource it to someone and you're not an expert, how do you know they're not a complete charlatan? Like, what what are the metrics you use to judge whether someone knows what they're talking about? And it'll often be they've worked at a big club. And I always say to people like football is not a meritocracy. There's not filtering all the way through where the best people work at the biggest clubs. Often I've I've met people who've worked at really, really like top end clubs and they're a tiny part of a huge machine. And then you go for guys from League Two and they do everything. And who's better? Who, who's better at running a football club? I would take probably the League Two guy over the tiny part of a big system guy because I know he's done a good job in all those departments. But it's far less sexy for the owner to say, I've, I've taken a guy out of, uh, out of Barrow than it is to say, I've got a guy from Barcelona. And you, they just assume he's his somehow better because his work there. And that's probably my big thing is you need someone who can speak to the sit almost between the owner and the sporting department to say, like, we should be like, I don't say I'm a football expert. But I say logically, I like people to say logically why what they're saying makes sense. So if you're telling me we need to play a possession based football, that best be backed up with like, for example, this club did it and they managed to get from here to here or this guy went in at a club and I, I talk about relevance of experience rather than just experience so this guy took over in a similar situation at maybe at a lower level he very quickly established a, a, a core starting 11 over the next year he added in um some more attacking flair and to me that's a logical way of building a club if you're saying this guy's brilliant he's he's, he's guaranteed success he's his his best coach i've ever worked with what can i do with that really it's just that's just like conjecture and third party opinions i can't really do anything with that but if i can go to an owner or a or a sporting director and say this this is i can't guarantee success but the evidence we've used is this and too often clubs will just say um he's done it before uh he's he's got teams promoted out of this league and i'm like well you've got a bottom three budget he had the biggest budget in the league he had a team that finished third the year before you finished 17th he had um yeah he had two different assistants with him who run all the sessions as far as we know and it's all these things like you're never guaranteed success but i think you give yourself a much better chance by logically working through that kind of thought process of why it might work and too often um it's just yeah he's he's done it before at a bigger club or he's he's, an, he's had a few jobs he's experienced and i the biggest thing i say hun hunger is underrated like the guy who has to make it work and it's his first shot at the level to me, is probably more likely to succeed in because he has to than someone who's kind of one of the circuit names who's who's been from club to club and done okay and has kind of found his level. I think sometimes you don't want to go for a complete complete punt on a novice, but I think as long as you've you've looked at what might be relevant to the job, I think it's a, a good good approach. Yeah, the the aspect I asked Jez uh, Jez George at Lincoln on um, hmm. recently and, and asked him about. You know, succession planning and he was quite open about the fact that, you know, that even with with michael in place at the minute that they go through a process um because you never know so yeah. i want to get your thoughts on on that there but before i do i want to ask you about number and uh, number two that that sometimes like you mentioned there i thought that was really interesting someone can be a small cog in the wheel uh, at a big club and it's branded but someone can also be branding themselves uh 
inaccurately in today's great day and age of social media and and how how do you gauge whether a number two because the charisma factor of a leader is such a big component mm. uh how do you look at that there and say or do you look at number twos in your in your platform as well or how, how do you distinguish yes yeah, so you, you obviously can't um get their own data so you have to look at the data of the places they've worked so a good example uh who's just gone at birmingham is someone like chris davis so he's been around, he was with Brendan Rogers, yeah. he was with Ange Postacoglu. He's been uh, very highly rated within coaching circles for a while. So it was always a name that's been cropping up linked with, with jobs. So if you're asked to assess someone like him or Eric Ramsey, who's gone to Minnesota, someone like that, what can you do? You can look at where they've worked. Um, that's, that, that tells you something. It tells you if they're leading first team sessions and then that first team is playing in that style. And I think people who work with Ange particularly end up running a lot of the sessions themselves. So you can look at, okay, well, Tottenham and Celtic and places have played that style of football. So can we look at that? And Leicester under Brendan played similar styles of football. So it's a consistency and he can definitely deliver a coaching session. And then it's after that, it's um, feedback within the industry. So everyone will say, great coach, uh, really innovative, really personable. It's then, can he handle the pressure and the media? And the only way to to really get that is by talking to them. So I haven't spoken to Chris, but I've spoken to lots of guys um, on the way up who are in these positions at the moment. Um, and it's just really like getting a handle on their personality. So I always say to them, if you want to get into the big jobs, almost do do the coach's voice, do podcasts, do that type of thing, because people will hear you speak and they'll hear how you explain your concepts. And that's a big part of it. So I think you have to build a profile. And then there's also, then they've got guys like, Ben Garner, for example, he worked with Tony Pulis. He could not be further away from Tony Pulis in how he uh, handles the team, both in terms of uh, personality and also in terms of how he likes to play football. He is, he is Mr. Possession football in, in the lower leagues. His Swindon team was one of the best kind of passing and building through the third teams uh, in the leagues in recent years. So you get people like that who are the complete opposite. So for people like that, they have to build a profile within the game because everyone will just assume you work with Tony, you, you play like Tony. Uh, you don't always. So I think these guys have to, what I say for interview for these guys is is include your philosophy documents, your your clips of your training sessions, your clips of any teams you've managed, their build-up play. Because you're going to be filtered. Your first filter is football people. The football department will be asked to come up with a list. So you need to get through that filter. So you need to win over those guys. We could work with this guy personality-wise. He could lead a group personality wise and he plays the style of football we want to play and or he's he he is aligned with our footballing philosophy or however you want to say it your second stage interview your final interview that's with the owners that's a different interview you've already passed the football test so with the owners it's could this guy be the face of our club like how does he come across how does he how does he cope with scrutiny could he cope with pressure um and can he be trusted to manage 100 million pounds worth of my money which is what you're asking them to do. So I always say to people going into those interviews, realize who your audience is. You've passed the football taste. You're now you're now in front of an owner, and the owner, whatever the football people think, the owner decides. Like the owner will choose the guy. So you're doing your pitch to him that I will add value to players. I will not fall out with your star player and get less money in the transfer market. I will play a brand of football that attracts fans. I will not get relegated or I'll get us into the Champions League, whatever the level of the club is, you're pitching to them that you can be trusted to to deliver on the the club strategy. Um, so, yeah, I'd say know your audience for interviews, but also build your portfolio in the right way if you're intending to go up through the levels. Brilliant. Brilliant. Kieran McKenna's success, uh, has that um, surprised you? Um, I think... He's had that reputation a bit like Eric Ramsey, a bit like Chris Davis coming through that this guy's doing stuff that people want. And the fact that Manchester United had, he was Tottenham before, wasn't he? He had kind of gone there and headhunted him. It's funny because uh, I remember when, when Solskjaer was at United, it was like oh, I was being held back by these terrible assistants and yeah. these, these uh, inexperienced young pups are nowhere near good enough to be at Manchester United. And now they're, they're the hottest property in football. So again, how much can you really judge uh, man assistant managers by reputation or by first team stuff? I think it's all those guys have had reputations. And I think uh, 
along with Skubala um, at uh, Lincoln, they'd come through at Loughborough University together, a few of them. So there's this kind of group of, of uh, guys who've been around coaching circles and at a young age had had, had um, experiences that made you think they might be good. I think uh, the, I don't think anyone would predict Ipswich had got so good in so quickly across two divisions. But I think if I'm looking, if I'm a, a Manchester United and I'm looking for my next manager, um, would I take someone who's not managed in Europe or is likely to? These may be famous last words if they win the league, but is likely to struggle in the Premier League next year because of the you've gone through two levels with essentially the same squad. But that's that's a big ask to play the same the same style of football, and I, I think he will be brave and try and he's probably not going to do a Thomas Frank and completely change the way they play football. I think he'll stick to the principles. So. It's then looking at that and saying, okay, Vincent Company got the Bayern Munich job after being relegated. So do do we look at that and say it's better to stick to your principles um and get the big job than to to be more pragmatic, change your style, stay in the league and be considered, oh, this guy's a long ball guy. <laughs> it's yeah. it's a hard dilemma. But yeah, Kieran's done brilliantly. And I think more and more the profile of managers getting getting those jobs will be the the 32-year-old project, like Brighton, they're, they're, they're allegedly taking a, a 31-year-old out of a second division of Germany. Like, who does that? Um, but on our data system, he's really high. We were lucky enough to go out to St. Pauli with a client um, last year and meet with, very briefly meet with the manager, but it was very clear that this guy was uh, something special in, in German coaching circles. So I think having having that knowledge of the market of, yeah, do you trust data to the extent Brighton do, which not many people do? But Brighton will sign someone out of the out of Ecuador after nine hundred minutes. They'll sign. They they believe in data, and I think their success has shown it works. And then it's just finding other clubs who are more risk averse, and we'll say it's all very well having data, but we're not in a position to take the risk. And I hear that all the time. Um, but the kind of Tony Bloom gambling background guys look at the percentages. They those type of guys will say to you. Will it work out? And if you say yes or no, and I've, I've not spoken directly to either of those guys, but they they will ask the type of guy will say, don't say yes or no, give me a percentage. So it'll be, I think there's a seventy percent chance this works out, and they'll respect that more than a hundred percent gaffer. That type of talk, it's not it's not what these kind of data guys want. They want a acknowledgement that everything is risk, and it's just, are you confident on our risk matrix that this is the right gamble to take, rather than kind of that traditional football, 100% yes or 100% no. They, they like the grey areas. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, very, very interesting. The the aspect then of taking that coach, say, say De Zerbe, who, when that coach is really hot property and has the ability to make that impact, but it's kind of like the Fergie thing as well from years ago where you want that not to be protected, but you want to control as much of the environment as possible. So you're going to need to bring in five, six staff uh, of your people to implement your philosophy. Is that a, is that a, a challenge for clubs? Not not a financial, but more mm. like a political challenge if you're bringing in a lot of... Hugely, hugely. Like I'd say um, the way clubs want to operate and probably the fact that Jose Mourinho and Antonio Conte and people who have got on the paper excellent records. I think people are looking at that style of manager now um, and saying... Okay, they're they're brilliant at what they do, but they're such dominant figures within the structure that if they leave, we're basically rebuilding. So the the kind of sporting director courses, everything is focused now around this this model of a coach being the coaching team being a a replaceable part within a, a larger context. And I think that's the logical way to build a club is to do that. Now, I say to um, clubs and to coaches when they ask me. Like how many guys can we bring? What's the, what's the typical structure? It does depend on the club. I say to clubs, make sure that you're hiring the brains of the operation because <laughs> you can take a coach and you can take one assistant, but maybe that was a group of five guys who are automatically aligned because they work together for years and you're taking two of them. Maybe the guy, one guy you're not bringing is the guy who after the game calms everyone down and stops him storming into the dressing room and ripping the place apart. Maybe the, the analyst is the guy Who's doing all the prep work? Maybe the uh, maybe the the goalkeeping coach is not just a goalkeeping coach, but is actually a a really good man manager of people. And and maybe these guys 
can say to each other, oh, can you do that session we did at, at Porto three years ago, you know, where we will had the same problem. And they all know, they can just do it. If you're taking one guy and one assistant, you're losing a lot of uh, of institutional knowledge from those people. So it's that, always that bounce about what should the club own? And the club wants to hold that information. They want one coach to be switched in and out or two or three coaches to be switched in and out. They don't want to have to rebuild from scratch. But when you're building that club model, maybe to begin with, you need to almost like get their intellectual property from them. And if it works really well, say Deserby comes in and is brilliant. Um, maybe you take some of the things he doesn't say. That's the way that we will always work. And then the next coach, maybe you say, instead of having a team of five, they have a team of three. And the next one, it's a team of two. And you're, you're making sure that the specific things you want them to do um, you've already got such an aligned game model, such an aligned way of working that you can just take one or two guys like Norwich have taken Thorup and um, Glenn Riddlesham and they've not even worked together, but they, I believe they think they have a good blend of personalities and a good blend of backgrounds that they, they can fit into a, a wider club model. But then you've got other clubs where they really don't think in that depth and they just need someone to come in and solve it. So they'll let them have six people and they'll just say, you run the footballing department that's fine. Um, and if we change, we change <laughs> and we'll take the risk. So what's better? I think, I think logically the, the, the small cog in a, a bigger machine is, is, is probably from an investor's point of view, probably a, the way they'd want to build it. But I don't think it's necessarily on the pitch. You look at the, the successful managers around the world, they tend to be quite dominant characters and personalities. Um, so I think there's, there's always a fine balance to be struck. It's, it's yeah, it's so complex, isn't it? Um, all right, last last couple for you. Um, investment and investors and managing investors, and obviously being based in America and working in America. Uh, how do you manage investors when they're based in the US or they're based and maybe from a financial model of where you know probably more for profit or, or definitely looking for a profit maybe sooner rather than mm. in England. Knowing the landscape, it's very, very difficult to make money off professional football, off ticket sales, and all that. So, I mean, I guess my question would be, yeah, like how how do you how do you communicate the reality of uh, the up and down nature of football? Yeah, and I think I think in some ways, and again, it's a massive stereotype, but a lot of the American guys are data guys. They they kind of their private equity or they've made them their their fortunes through having levels of management information that aren't available in most football clubs. And one of the things we do is build kind of management systems for clubs. So we, we, we kind of look at it from the approach of, if I, if I was an owner, what would I want? And for me, if I was an owner, I want to know, my biggest cost base is my players. So I want to know that, that when someone's asking me for £5 million and another five in wages, that a process has been followed and it's been followed through properly. And I, that's transparent and visible to me. And a lot of these guys are shocked when they go into a club and all, all they get is a, a one-page PDF asking for five million with kind of some subjective comments on a player saying, we think he's good, uh, rating A. Uh, please, can you sign, sign the cheque? <laughs> and I'm like, I wouldn't accept that as an owner and I don't think owners should accept that, but it's it's common. So again, ownership is, they don't realise often realise how powerful they are. I said earlier about that. Um, you're the experts. I, I'm a, I'm a, they often say I'm a dumb American. Like I don't understand football at all, or soccer at all. I don't understand it. You you run that. I will just uh, I will affect. And the, all the person is hearing then all the agents, all the all the, they're just hearing. Right, okay, money. <laughs> this is this is a guy that we can. And it's that alignment of interests again. It's like well, everyone in a football club is there looking for a better job all the time. Um, and because it's so volatile, we know we know we know as a consulting firm, let alone as a member of staff, that you can get a phone call one day and you're, you're gone. So you you need your reputation to be based on good results. So you're, the best way to get good results is to spend lots of money quickly, and and hope it works. So I always say to them like, have a strategy, design a strategy, ensure that it's actually followed, and you have a step a process to to follow, and that those processes are being followed. Demand reporting against measurable some objective data um, and make sure that you have business plans and bullet points and, and takeaways from meetings that that align with that business plan 
I would say most football clubs don't run like that. I think most people think they should, but I think the reality of day-to-day head-down involvement in the club is it's, you're fighting fires all the time. Other last night a player was spotted in town and his agents on on the phone demanding he leaves and <laughs> some incident in the youth team has got some pranks gone out of hand and now one of your best youth players is leaving and all that level of stuff it's constant and it's distracting and everyone needs to be involved and is pulled out of scheduled meetings because something's happened and that happens every day so you need some kind of separation between long-term strategy and short-term management of a club and often they put the same people in charge of both and so the strategy gets lost so i'm always saying like you need you need ways of working that enable you to to see what's going on without getting caught in the minutiae of every day so yeah that kind of man management culture stuff separate to the objective stuff and try and keep it separate from the, the long term from the short term so yeah we work a lot on that and i think american owners buy into that um and they they tend to be the ones who are saying i like those ideas let, let's do it um a lot of the time um kind of your you kind of battle-hardened English club owners. They've bought football clubs because they love football and they love transfers and they love they love playing football manager as a kid and now they now they are rich enough to own a club. They want to be involved. They know they shouldn't, but they want to they want that kind of um buzz. there's there's far better ways to make money than buying a football club. You buy it because you wanna you want to turn a uh, get a small fortune from a large fortune and all those cliches that people say but um it's uh, it's true. It's 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 a hard business to make money in. You've got a big cost base. You've got luck. You've got things outside your control. Your your best player does their ACL. You can lose. That can be something that costs you tens of millions. Uh, on the other hand, you can have a player sold for a hundred million that you developed, and you get twenty million quid suddenly coming into the club. So there's ups and downs every day, and having that rational approach. Um, numbers driven whatever you want to call it is quite a nice way of separating that emotion from the the uh how are we doing overall like what's our direction of travel and that's i think where data helps yeah it's almost as well to that like 100 million or you do make money or something does go well it's like winning the lottery and telling everyone isn't it like everyone's uh, your vultures are going to yeah. be charging you everyone distributors are now charging you triple um our last one for you what about Talk a little bit about the journey then of market market insights. I mean, how how have you with the game changing and the way it hmm. has over the last ten years? Wh- when did you see this coming, and when has it blown up? Yeah, so I think um, we started as a company in 2019, so probably the worst timing ever to do a start just before a, a global pandemic. And uh, uh, we we started very much on player recruitment. We're all football fans. We'd all been kind of doing bits and pieces on the periphery of football with agencies or or clubs just reading our twitter feeds and messaging us asking for suggestions we thought let's get together and do a kind of case study of what we would do if we worked with a football club so we we put together this like 100 page report on a on swansea city just as a an example to send it to them um and about a month or two later met up in a a service station off the m25 as most football meetings happen and uh and agreed to work with them as a consultancy um kind of snowballed quickly we started working with um some quite champions league level clubs on consulting projects right down to like national league clubs and cambodia india usa all over the world really working with clubs mainly on player recruitment and probably in the last two years we thought actually a lot of this stuff we're doing with players um the way we work the way we think the way we worked outside of football we were all consultants and uh data scientists it's like why don't we just take what we've seen over the last two, three years in football that we don't like and see if we can find some solutions around just logical, crit- critical thinking, process, engineering, all the all the boring bits of our old jobs we thought we'd left behind when we were signing players. Let's take some of that stuff and, and put it into a context of football. So let's have like a, a seven-step process for sign-off. Like let's look at some checks and balances you can put into these, these things to make sure that some of the mistakes we were seeing other clubs make um, outside of our client base, but also within our client base, you've seen kind of a, a contract agreed over a, a WhatsApp that should have gone through a process and all these types of things that we were noticing, like if I was an owner, would I want that? No. So let's let's build some processes, let's build some software, let's build some consulting services based around making sure that coaches make sense, there's a strategy in place and the processes for sign-offs in all the key areas of a club in place. So 
in the last two years, that's kind of probably been not the main focus. We still do a lot of player stuff, but it's become a growing part of the business. We've done some head coach hires, some advisory work. We do a lot of um, contingency planning, so build systems that kind of monitor the market for suitable future coaches, because as you say, you never know. They can. It's that Goldilocks problem in football where you're you're at the level, then it's you're too bad or you're too good, and there's a very thin band where you're either going to be sacked or poached. And uh, we're talking 18 months average span at best, probably even less than that now, 14 months I think I've seen now for uh, top division managers. So you're changing all the time. So you need to be prepared. And it's it's not frightening, but it's surprising how uh, even big clubs, it catches them unawares and they, they're like, we haven't got anyone on the list. We don't even know where to start. But if you've got a, a style of play you're wedded to and you can code that up and you can say, straight away here's 20 guys in the last three seasons who have hit all the all the metrics you want from your coaches six of them are currently on the market let's reach out to them let's let's work with you about the culture the personality the the media interviews let's do some some soft skills chats with them let's let's interview them informally first and when a job comes up we're ready to go like we we have zooms and coffees and i've met some really um people you never think someone like me would be able to get to have got in touch with us and said oh here you're doing manager stuff can we have a chat and we go meet up in london for a, a meal or something and have a a nice just general chat about football and then nothing will happen for a year and then someone will say do you know that guy and i'll be like oh yeah i met him for lunch he was really nice we had talked and i think he's i don't think he's right for you but I, next time someone else will say it and think yeah i think i could see him at this club and you can send him a whatsapp and say are you interested? And if he is, when the job comes up, we we get him over. So it's really like we work on behalf of the clubs. We're not an agent, so we're not taking money from the manager. But um, we just find it really good to have that market knowledge for us as a company. So we just, uh, yeah, it's not the worst lifestyle in the world having to go and meet a, a manager in uh, London for a, for a pint at lunchtime and have a chat about football. So that's, uh, that's something we're really happy to do. Yeah, like I can tell, I can tell. It's probably why this interview's gone 15, 20 minutes over. Is like I can <laughs> I tell that you love football. Um, I can tell that you're genuinely a football fan. So I can see where the kicks are with that there. Um, where where does oh, last question for you? A bit of a random one. LinkedIn, like, is that a big? Is that your biggest kind of connection with? Because I see that space getting bigger quickly with football business and recruitment. Mm. Is that a big area for you? I was a Twitter guy. I was I was only on Twitter. I, I regarded as LinkedIn as being horrible business cliche. Yeah. I just oh, I hated LinkedIn. Twitter has died. Like it's just. Oh, yeah. I I used to write articles before I worked in football. You used to write an article. It'd be like five hundred likes. I'd get inbound DMs from clubs ask saying how good it was. Now ten likes if I'm lucky. <laughs> and I and I put the same on LinkedIn, and I'm getting connections from club owners and. And people, so LinkedIn is where football is now. It's moved. It's moved platform completely. Um, I my advice to everyone um, in football who wants to break into the industry is write stuff down, write blogs. Uh, I have this thing people say to me, and it really annoys me. They're like, "Oh, I don't want to give away my ideas." I'm like, "If you're worried about running out of ideas, you're not right for the job. You should have your head should be bursting with ideas every day. You should be constantly thinking of ways to to help clubs and." give competitive advantage. And the only way, like people write to me all the time saying, I want to work for you. And it's like a two line email. I'm like, I can't do anything with that. The one, everyone we've hired, and we've got like five or six guys working for us now, in addition to the the five or six owners. um, Every one of them has come from the blogging space because they show their working and they show their thought process. They've given stuff away, yes, but it it has no value, the stuff in your brain, if you don't have a, a way of monetizing it. So the only way to do it is to, to, uh, to do it. And one guy wrote to me from Switzerland and, and sent me this really good piece of work. And now he runs like the, 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 the dark region, which is Germany, Switzerland and Austria, part of our company. So we've, we've he is now like a, almost like a, a subset of the company, which he runs out there. And he's, he's getting interest in a new market for us in this, this, this area. So certainly um, a bit of get up and go goes a long way and, and uh, putting yourself out there. And it's just go for it. Let's say if you're interested. Brilliant. Tim, top class. Thank you so much. Loved it. Loved I've it. enjoyed it. Thank yeah. you for your time.